Welcome to the Rioja Wellness Show. We're glad you tuned in. My name is Margit Jeppesen and I'm here with Andre Gosbatacek, founder of Rioho. Our specialty is integrating mindful wellness and corrective health into your daily life. We work with you to make incremental changes that will deliver even more mojo in everything you do. We work on your total health through effective nutrition and targeted exercise. Typically, this improves emotional and physical issues and leads to much more energy, a fit and healthy body and mind, and in general, just a much more abundant life. One of our things is that if your body is more in balance, you feel better. And if you feel better, you have more energy. And if you have more energy, everything around you works just that little bit better, delivering improved results. And that's what we mean by a much more abundant life. We see Rioho Wellness as giving you a secret for amazing health and wellness. Those in the know have changed their lifestyle and have the results that stick. This is what we want for you. We are just about to start the episode for today. It's on a specific wellness issue that we see in our community every day. It may just help you or someone you know on some level. And at the end, I'll be here to give you a little bit more information about Rioho. In the meantime, let's get into this episode and we hope you enjoy. This is a very special episode. It's all about one of the very sacred parts of being female. It's about period health. There are so many teenage girls and women who have problems with their menstrual cycle, thinking that it's normal or thinking they just need to put up with it or that it will get better soon or simply that they just don't know what to do about it. And then there's other women that would say the symptom isn't so bad that they need to go and see someone about it, but it's uncomfortable every single month and it's just something that is part of their makeup. We've been looking forward to presenting this episode for a very long time and it works in conjunction with our period health program. What we decided to do today is to break the episode into two parts. So this is part one and we highly recommend that you follow up on part two when it's shortly released. Now without further introduction, let's get into this episode and start with the first question. How common are period problems in the community based on your practice? I see quite a few of them but they come up in two ways. The women with menstrual difficulties appear in the clinic with menstrual problems in great pain and and discomfort and they're usually extreme cases and the other category that appear people with say back trouble or some difficulty like that and I will mention that usually this kind of issue is accompanied by menstrual pain and they would say yes I do have trouble but I thought that was normal there's this whole other category of people that have been misled into thinking that having some kind of discomfort every month is normal. This has happened because in our society, what is average is considered normal, but that's not the case. Just because a lot of people have got these problems doesn't mean that it is normal to have these problems. So two types of categories. And on a regular basis, I discover problems in people and also they come with these sorts of complaints. Of course, there's lots of help available for women with these difficulties, ranging from teenage girls being put on the pill as a way of solving the problem to women in later years having some kind of menopausal difficulty and given hormonal treatment. So there's all sorts of ways of dealing with it. Not all of them effective and some of them actually make the problem worse in a different way. 
So the net's actually wider than we think. It's not just women who are coming in saying they've got period mm-hmm. problems. They're coming in with other problems which are linked, right. which they're not aware of. Absolutely. So you've got, say, early years in a woman's life and they feel discomfort and they're told it's no big problem and that a lot of people have this trouble, which is kind of true, and they're put on some medication. This unfortunately leads to bigger problems later where we end up seeing the sort of people that I see most regularly with menstrual problems, which is they've got some kind of fibrous issue, they've got growths in their abdomen because the whole system has been shut down. The medicine type approach is where you're given a particular kind of chemical on a regular basis to suppress functioning in the uterus and then that leads to some kind of stagnation. Unfortunately, the end result can be some kind of deterioration in the organ. If something's not functioning or is suppressed in its functioning, then it tends to become corrupted in some way. So I would link these two problems together. So what I'm saying is that quite often the treatments that are given that just suppress the symptom like painkillers or shutting down the menstrual cycle altogether, which is a common type of treatment these days that might lead to major issues later on. That's what we see in all fields of health where if you just avoid the problem, of course, it's slowly going to get worse. If you shut down the symptom and not treat the cause, you're asking for bigger problems, of course. What are the types of things that you look at as an indicator that there is a problem in a woman's cycle? Yeah, of course. Bloating is one of them. The belly swells up a lot. That's because it's all a fluid process. The the whole of that function of menstrual process is all related to blood and the lymph and if it's not working properly it just bloats up the whole belly swells in some cases really dramatically so bloating which might be the only symptom because a lot of the other symptoms are suppressed with painkillers back pain because there's some kind of imbalance between the pelvic floor tensions. In other words, the uterus is misplaced. It can be sitting in the wrong place. Blood stagnates, the body twists to compensate. In other words, the hips are rotated, the pelvic floor isn't balanced, the posture is unstable, the whole of the spine twists to compensate. So now in any woman who's had long-term menstrual difficulties can relate to what I'm saying because pain in the back is part of the symptoms of menstrual irregularity because it's connected. The uterus has a big impact on the spine. It becomes congested on one side or the other because the way that it all works is one ovary works one month, the other ovary works another month. There's a left-right process that happens within the reproductive organs in a woman. And this left-right thing can become very unbalanced and it needs to be balanced. Then the spine twists, unfortunately, if it's unbalanced. Plus the uterus can be in the wrong position. You can get folding of the uterus. You can get the uterus tipping forward, tipping backwards, too high, too low. It needs to be held in the right place. The posture can be affected enormously by blood stagnation or some kind of fibrous growth. Another symptom is the growth of fibers within the uterus or extending outside the uterus wall into the intestines and it affects digestion. It can affect the bowels, it can affect the small intestine and create what we call IBS or irritable bowel syndrome which in fact can be within the small intestine also. So pain in eating, malnutrition, all of these symptoms, in other words, strong food cravings just before the menstrual cycle starts, great fatigue, low iron, poor physical health resulting from 
the body not being able to manufacture or maintain or absorb different kinds of vitamins and minerals, wide range of symptoms. If the menstrual irregularities are not dealt with and slowly become worse and worse, it's like any other part of the body that is not dealt with and nurtured back to normal health because any part of the body is important to have functioning properly. It'll affect the rest of the body in the end. It'll make a very big impact on all other systems within the body makeup. And it's important that people understand that none of these sorts of problems are going to just stay the way it is. It's only going to become worse and affect other organs. It's all connected. It's important to know that the uterus is an integral part of the physical health for women. It all becomes very, very evident as they get older. It becomes obvious when we try to get pregnant. It becomes obvious when we try to have a natural birth. It becomes obvious when there's great difficulties after having children, things like depression and back pain, lack of sexual appetite, and then lots of difficulties later on where there's some menopause problem. Can you go through some of the symptoms that listeners would relate to personally when they have their period that they may be thinking is normal, but actually it's not? A bit more graphically, women can experience great pain leading up to their menstrual cycle where there's stabbing pain in their stomach. There's a wide range of symptoms that can be associated with menstrual health, but what most people would understand and relate to a very basic. There's great pain and suffering leading up to the menstrual cycle. It can be extreme and of course it can be more mild and it can just be even just an emotional collapse where very irritable or depressed. That can last for a few days leading up to the menstrual cycle and go through the menstrual cycle and even some mania can happen. But generally the opposite where there's a very flat time there. Some mild flatness is normal, of course. Great fatigue is not normal. So some stabbing pains in the belly, great discomfort in the back is common. Sharp pains in the spine. This is because the blood stagnation can make the belly collapse on the left or on the right, in the upper or lower parts, and the body twists and bends to compensate, and the spine can be greatly affected. So any any woman experiencing back pain during the menstrual cycle knows that it'll pass once the menstrual difficulties pass also. It's common knowledge. So that's one of the great symptoms is pain in the belly, pain in the back. The other is very heavy flows lasting for days. Normal is three days, but it can go up to a week and that's not normal. Skipping cycles where there's not enough blood is part of it and that can just mean you have irregular patterning in the cycles and that's quite common also. And even though it can be treated with medication, it's going to lead to all sorts of problems where we can have fibrous growth. A lack of regular flow means that the endometrium doesn't come out and we can all end up with lots of problems there. Clotting is part of that where there's not good flow and the reasons for that we'll go into, but where there's clots of blood coming out, it's not clean, nice, healthy blood for just a few days. So general symptoms, bloating, sharp pain in the belly, discomfort in the back, irregular flows and clotting, emotional turmoil. These are generally the obvious symptoms associated with poor menstrual health. And what about things like bodily functions, such as constipation, poor digestion, bladder issues, that sort of thing? Does that come into it? Menstrual health is directly connected with other organ symptoms. It can start with bladder functions being unbalanced and overtaxed by an unhealthy diet or 
poor posture, some sort of infection, and that can then lead to menstrual problems. And it can be the other way around. So as a general rule in natural therapies, we understand that everything's connected. You can have bowel problems that lead to menstrual health issues where you're not absorbing your iron and and it's fairly common knowledge that poor iron levels can lead to menstrual health issues. If you've got problems with your menstrual health, it can lead to bowel problems where from some sort of fibrous growth, the endometrium can grow outside the uterus and affect the bowels. That's one of the things that can happen. So it can go one way or the other. Having some kind of imbalance with your cycle can affect your hormones enormously and this can lead to really bad eating patterns. It can affect you in a way where you have huge binges of eating really bad food. It can make you have very strong cravings for animal products or the other end of the spectrum, sugar, and this can lead to all sorts of problems with your health also. So it can go one way or the other. So the menstrual health can affect our bowels, our small intestine, it can affect our bladder, our kidneys, and the spine also, as I mentioned earlier. Poor menstrual health can lead to very bad posture because the body tends to twist and tends to fold forward a little bit over the discomfort. We tend to protect the area that's difficult and the spine will bend and twist a little bit to compensate for the problems in the front, in the belly that can lead to the spine being out of alignment. And just one simple thing or two simple things can then damage the spine a lot. So if the spine's out of alignment and you can do a little bit of exercise or lift something and you can cause some damage there in the back or over a long period of time, it just tends to deteriorate in the spine by being in the wrong place all the time over many years. So menstrual health can lead to lots of spine problems also. A lot of women do just put up with it and wait for the day that they go through menopause so that it can all stop and have the perception that once the menstrual cycle is stopped and gone, then everything will be okay. But you're saying that that's not necessarily true, that it does have a profound impact on long-term health if you have problems. They might have that idea that eventually it'll go away and they might be getting some relief with painkillers, but it's leading to more problems later on and even after menopause, which can last for a very long time and the suffering can be really severe with menopause. It's difficult to deal with, even with modern medications. They don't seem to be as effective as they used to be in a lot of cases and even though they're, they're... refining the process more and more in treating menopause, it, it, it doesn't seem to be keeping up with the deterioration. So what's happening is that the treatments that are being used for women's health, menstrual pain and different issues associated with it, in some ways becoming more effective because of the nature of that process of becoming more effective at suppressing the symptoms and creating more problems with menopause, which on the other end they're finding more difficult to cope with. So even if we avoid to some degree the symptoms and wait for menopause to solve them for us, it's actually not a good way to think because you're going to have lots of troubles. Years and years of discomfort and irritability and anger and makes everyone unhappy around you also. And the thing is that it's not that hard to fix up. There's no need for all the suffering and no need for all of this trouble to keep happening all the time where suddenly your your life becomes very, very difficult on a monthly basis. There's no need for that. And it's easy to fix up. And all this suffering can be cleared up in a relatively short period of time. There's two parts to it. And one is that a lot of people don't know what they don't know and just assume that their symptoms are a part of life and they just have to put up with it and they go to the doctor. And then the doctor will prescribe a marina or contraception or some sort of other medical pharmaceutical treatment 
and that covers the symptom up. And then the patient goes home and thinks, okay, well, this is fixed now. I've actually fixed this. Why isn't the medical profession and the specialist profession more concerned with fixing the cause? Why do they just prescribe contraceptive pills for 15-year-olds who have got period problems? You know, and there's something really wrong there. And I don't understand why someone in the medical profession, you know, is not getting behind the symptoms and looking at the cause. What, what's your perspective on that? There's two ideas there. One of them is that they're not trained in dealing with the cause of the problem. In other words, how to change a person's health by prescribing lifestyle adjustments, which is the cause of the trouble. We are a product as human beings of our lifestyles and how we live is what we become. It's a lovely thing the other day someone told me, which is that when we're young, we have the face that God gave us. And as we get older, we develop the face that we've made, which I think is a lovely testament to how we are as human beings. You can start off all bouncy and well, but even in your younger years, if you're not doing the right thing as an adolescent, you can lead to severe problems in puberty later on in menstrual health, right throughout a woman's life. And there's really no need for it if we understand the cause of the problem. So one of the biggest parts is, I think, for the medical profession, they are not trained in treating the cause of the problem. The other issue is that the very nature of Western medical science is to provide a service. It's a democratic process where you're allowed to live the lifestyle that you want to and they are there to provide support in that. They're providing a service and treatments and therapies and different kinds of tools and medicines, machines that allow you to live the lifestyle that you want to live as long as you can pay for that service, then you're okay. And the more money you've got and the better support systems you have, you can just keep on living the lifestyle you want to. So people are overeating and they get treatments for weight loss. And that's the nature of our modern world now, where we don't have to take responsibility so much. So that's the other side. Of course, a lot of people don't know how to deal with the cause and they would be very grateful to be able to know how to deal with the cause of the problem because the service that is being provided is not being effective. I mean, if it would be great just to take a pill and fix all the problems, but in the end, it doesn't really work because the nature of life is that we need to deal with the cause. You can't just keep covering up the symptom. There's two sides to it. Pain and discomfort is nature's warning saying you are doing the wrong thing. Menstrual irregularity is a, a reflection of wrong action. It's a reflection of living the wrong way, which is affecting you on many other levels also. It's not just going to affect your, your menstrual health. So that's one understanding that is, I think, really missing in the modern Western medical approach is that fixing up the symptom is actually the wrong thing to do. Using the symptom as a guide to success is the right thing to do. So if you have some discomfort menstrually, we need to do the right things to fix that rather than cover those symptoms up. And if you're doing the right things, the problem goes away. It's a red light. It's a warning. It's a tap on the shoulder from nature saying that you're doing the wrong thing. It's not something to be ignored by just covering it up. It's like a bad smell. It's a sign that something is inappropriate, that something is wrong. It's If something is ugly, it's wrong. It's a sign that it's inappropriate and needs to be dealt with. If something is uncomfortable, it's a sign that it's inappropriate and needs to be dealt with. Pleasure, comfort, ease and delight is a normal state for human beings and you don't get that by ignoring the thing that is talking to you which is nature. Nature provides health, it creates our existence, it makes our heartbeat, 
It makes our blood flow. It makes us breathe. It makes us think. It wakes us up. It supports our lives through providing food and light and air. And we need to surrender to that and listen to it, not think that we are smart enough to just shut it down and everything will be okay. Yeah, I think that's a very elegant way of putting it because no woman should have to put up with debilitating symptoms and not be able to live their life. And, you know, that goes for a 15-year-old who can't go on school camp because she's got heavy periods or it goes for someone who can't go to work because they've got excruciating pain. And I completely get that those symptoms need to be managed as quickly as possible. It's just unfortunate that in the management of those symptoms that the medical profession doesn't say, okay, now let's try and start the dialogue about what might be causing this as opposed to, okay, sure. how, what's the management plan? And But I, I, I think you've put it very elegantly that everyone has a right to live their life and if they can have a an inquiring mind as to how to fix these things, then that's where it starts, doesn't it? You just have to ask the first question. Absolutely. And it's not a matter of creating more suffering in your life by denying yourself of the foods you like. It's not a matter of creating more stress and strain in your life by doing physical workouts every day and running up and down the beach. It's a matter of doing the right thing. It's like we have to brush our teeth. We have to wash under our armpits. It's a normal thing. And it's just that people have not been educated into understanding basic hygiene in terms of women's health and certain things are appropriate and certain things are not appropriate. If you have a condition, then we need to fix that up. And for one person, it might be okay to animal products and they don't have a, a menstrual problem. For another person, depending on their constitution, depending on their embryonic health, when what it depends on, on what their mother ate while they were in the womb. It depends on their early childhood, how active they were, their heritage. It all depends and it all varies. We're all different and they need to discover as individuals what suits them, what fixes their problems and we're not all the same. We all need different things. But if we understand what causes the menstrual health problems, we can easily explore those issues, very easily experiment with things and have the absolute delight and joy of really solving the problem that then has wonderful repercussions on all sorts of other levels for everything from cellulite to bloating in the belly to standing straighter to feeling more assertive just being a more stable comfortable person within yourself is solving your own problems through simple knowledge is a wonderful process you're not in debt to anyone and you grow as a human being in your understanding of who you are, your place on the planet. It's a lovely process. It's really wonderful. Leading on from that, what do you think are the top three things that cause menstrual issues? The number one is diet, which is what women turn to to solve their problems automatically. I don't think any woman who's got menstrual health issues would argue that they have cravings. Food is directly linked, in other words, the manufacturing of blood within the body, the maintenance of pH level. Nutrition and blood are are directly linked. Diet, of course. The other is exercise. Not exercise in terms of running up and down the beach, but in terms of maintaining correct posture. Maybe we need to build our back strength. Maybe we need to build our gut strength. Maybe we need to balance our hips so that the pelvic floor is stable, which is a very big issue for menstrual health. So exercise in terms of just maintenance, simple little things that one should do. You'll see it in different cultures. Our culture has lost this sort of idea that intellect, health and wisdom are all connected. The world is ancient world in our history is deeply understanding of that very simple idea. In fact, the word gymnasium is still used in Europe for high school. The ancients knew that physical health and mental health are directly connected. So just that simple thing of maintenance based on exercise, that's really 
directly connected, I think, to menstrual health also. And the third thing is knowing that the breath is really important to maintain our simple ideas of menstrual health where deep breathing and maintaining stability in other words that allowing the diaphragm to move all the way down into the belly this is something that has to be done consciously we're easily affected by our emotions as as human beings staying calm and relaxed and stable and breathing deeply in other words not letting emotions run our lives and allowing stress to overwhelm us breathing and maintaining our health. In other words, uh, being control of our emotions by understanding what emotions are, understanding our feelings, what they arise from, and trying to overcome all of that by breathing very deeply, being relaxed, and knowing what that means is to lead to a really happy, healthy life. And then the menstrual cycle will fall into place. The menstrual cycle is a byproduct abundance in other words we will naturally be reproductive and have this extra energy for the reproductive cycle if we have a little bit of abundance in our lives so to create this abundance this extra energy that leads to having a healthy reproductive cycle it comes from having good nutritional levels a healthy stable physical body and an outgoing, calm, relaxed, emotional, emotionally stable personality. So those three things, I think, are really important. So I think diet and exercise to maintain correct posture are fairly easy concepts to grasp. And this breath work is also, I know what's behind that, and so I understand that, but you're linking it to emotional well-being. And so I'm wondering if you can just explain the linkage between emotional well-being and breath work, how that fits together. When anyone's upset, the breath gets caught in the chest. So if we're crying, sobbing, the breath is in the upper body, it gets caught, the energy gets caught in the chest. Our girlfriends will pat us on the back or the boyfriend will rub us between the shoulders and and trying to calm that energy down. But the shoulders go up and down, the chest heaves, as opposed to being calm, which is the belly moves in and out. So maintaining an emotional adolescent or immature, underdeveloped state, maintaining an emotional childish behavior is going to lead to poor health menstrually. The menstrual cycle and reproductive health is an adult thing. It requires energy in the hips. It requires energy and functionality in the lower belly, warmth and blood and strength. But if your shoulders are up around your ears from tension, if your energy is caught in your chest all the time, if you're a constant state of stress and self-indulgence where you're keeping your emotional state high all the time, keeping your breath caught in your chest all the time, then it's going to lead to poor menstrual health. The blood's not going to be in the belly. The movement's not going to be in the belly. The the belly is not going to be nurtured by the diaphragm moving down towards the the lower abdomen, and you're going to have stagnation there. So the shoulders get tight, the lower back gets tight, the belly gets tight by us not standing up straight and breathing deeply. So it might seem like a little thing, If we look at ourselves and other people that we know, if they're in a constant emotional state, no one wants to be with them, really. It's a normal thing for us to back away from people who are constantly emotional and difficult to be with. On the other hand, people who are welcoming, forgiving, generous, extravagant with their love, then they're going to attract people much more easily and going to have people wanting to be with them on a permanent basis. They're going to, of course, attract people to have children with them. It's a normal thing. People who are a little bit forgiving, people who take a a slightly religious attitude towards their lives where they're generous and forgiving to other people around them and try to not always blame everyone 
for their emotional state and try and take some responsibility. I mean, the simple idea is, we all know this, is that if you breathe deeply and go for a walk and think about it for a little while, that you'll feel a lot better. That breathing deeply is a really good way to go. And of course, things like alcohol and marijuana and sugar and chemicals, they're they're all going to make us emotionally unstable. The Greek word for the uterus is hysterium. We've developed the word hysteria from that, of course. If we can make the uterus healthy and strong by breathing deeply into it, we feel more emotionally stable. On the other hand, if you maintain your emotional stability by breathing deeply into the belly, then you actually heal the uterus. You're going to help heal it. Of course, that's not enough in a lot of cases. The vast majority of our issues are diet and physically related, but part of that process is connected to our emotions, so not letting them overtake us, not letting ourselves be overwhelmed and take responsibility for our emotional state. It's a difficult path and it's a constant thing to deal with on a daily basis, but it's absolutely necessary for basic menstrual health is to learn to be calm and relaxed and breathe and keep our energy centered lower in our bodies and not let it rise up and choke us with emotions. I think there's a lot in what you just said, but one of the things I picked up was healing the uterus is a very important thing. And I think also connecting to the uterus as a very important and beautiful part of the female body is something that a lot of women don't necessarily think about very often. There's a very big disconnect between what's going on in the reproductive system and what goes on in the head. (laughs) I think the the heart is regarded as a vital organ and the liver is regarded as a vital organ, but there's not too much chat about the uterus being regarded as a vital organ. So I think healing the uterus is such a beautiful concept. Sexual health is part of it, of course. If we travel the world and meet different people and really get to understand different cultures, we'll see that human beings in different cultures have very different attitudes towards menstrual health and menstrual cycles and sexual health. Very, very different where different religions have imposed themselves on different parts of the world and created all sorts of disconnects with the sexual health and menstrual health and other cultures don't have those disconnects. I don't think there's even a word for menopause in some cultures. They don't have the problem. Or maybe they're developing them now because our culture has infused itself, infected <laughs> these other cultures a lot now with McDonald's and Coca-Cola and all the rest of it. Traditionally, I believe a lot of cultures don't have these words and these problems didn't exist. There's, there's um, all sorts of different ways of looking at these things. Little world might seem like the whole world, but in fact, having very different focus in different cultures shows us that human beings don't need to suffer with these difficulties. Just a change, a little change in lifestyle and looking at our history very quickly shows us that a lot of the modern problems weren't there, that a lot of our problems are manufactured. And there's no need for them. It's creating very big problems, not just on the menstrual health level, but also on the sexual health level, which are very connected. The menstrual health can, as soon as it gets a little bit straight and a little bit healthier, has repercussions on so many levels, not just emotional, but sexually also. If we regard the uterus as something that needs to be healed in this process, what kind of things were you talking about or thinking about when you mentioned that diet is one of the big issues that causes everything to get out of kilter. What type of foods specifically should be a no-go zone for women suffering major issues? When I talk about the difference between natural health and, and the real healing that can occur for people and the only way that we can have real healing or health is to surrender to nature, which is where we come from. Modern science can only chop things up and try and stick them back together again. They can't actually create anything. The 
health and life comes from nature, we need to surrender back to that and understand the complexity of it and also the simplicity of it at the same time. Why I'm saying that is that when it comes to diet, we don't look at it the, the same way. We don't take an average and say, okay, everyone needs to eat this amount of meat and this amount of protein and that amount of carbohydrate and everyone should have this amount of minerals. It just doesn't work that way. Everyone is different. And when you're sick, it's very different to a healthy person. When you're 40, it's very different to when you're 80. When you're 15, it's totally different to when you're 25. When you're sick, it's totally different to when you're healthy. When you're unwell, you need to eat a very particular way to get well again. And when you're well, you don't worry about that anymore. You eat according to your needs. And that's extremely important to understand. So when people tell you, stop eating meat, Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. You know, it really depends upon you. And just because it worked wonders for them doesn't mean it's going to work wonders for you. So getting that out of the way, at the same time, a lot of menstrual health is caused by excessive saturated fat, problems coming from that, eating lots of animal products in a warm climate for women tends to create congestion in the gut area that way. In that way, we're going to have menstrual problems in a warm climate if you eat a lot of meat. It just creates a lot of heaviness, a lot of congestion, and too much protein is going to create all those sorts of problems in the gut. So the very first thing I'd say is look at the amount of animal products and dairy products you're eating as one of the first things and understand that whole grains are very important staple food for human beings. We're designed to eat a lot of whole grains. So that would be one of the first things I'd be talking about is animal products. The other things would be preservatives. There's a lot of preservatives in foods. Sugar is one of them, and the chemical preservatives that are used tend to kill the natural bacterial growth that is a company's absorption of the minerals and maintains menstrual health. It's important to have that bacterial process in the gut that allows us to absorb the simple nutrients that allows menstrual health. It's important to avoid those sorts of things too. So keeping the animal products low is one of the first things that you'd look at, especially in the warmer climates. It really depends on the person. They need to explore it. It's case by case. That's the difference between natural health and modern medical ideas. And it's nice to hear that someone had great success by eating lots of maple syrup or cutting out their bacon or reducing gluten. It's wonderful that they get these successes. Is that going to work for you? And why did it work for them? These are very important things to explore, to understand. And it's very simple ideas that once we know how our bodies work and what areas to play with and what areas to look at, we can easily figure these things out. And it's not a matter of depriving ourselves. Things like meat used as a substitute for good food. Meat is a condiment. It's not a, something that we need to have all the time in great amounts. And things like butter is a, a substitute for not having oil. It's not the other way around where we substitute grain for meat. It's not the other way around where we substitute oil for butter. It's butter and meat and these sorts of things are very difficult to maintain in a warm climate without refrigeration. These are all modern substitutions for a basic healthy diet. And some of us have lost track of the fact that Good quality, simple, wholesome, whole foods are an essential part of, of a natural lifestyle. And we become very easily adapted and addicted to all sorts of chemicals. And even just mentioning it puts fear into people's lives. It's quite exciting to know a very simple thing. If you just start a little bit and add it to your diet, that it creates massive changes and it's easily affects you on all levels. So adding some simple things to your diet, you realize, oh my God, I don't even want meat anymore, that I was using it as a substitution. I was just hungry. All I needed was some good food. 
and all I knew was bacon and avocado and eggs and didn't realize that it was causing such big problems. We all get hungry. We need to eat. And if you stop eating stuff, you just get hungry. You need to eat good food. That's all. And in fact, you realize what a great relief that is and your symptoms go away and you feel so much better. So it's not a big deal to change your diet. It's just a little bit of re-education, that's all. And what about dairy? I'm surprised you didn't mention much about dairy in that in that equation. You talked a little bit about butter, but cheeses and milk products and yogurt sure. and all the things that people consume on a daily basis in quite sure. significant quantities. Sure. Of course, dairy products are in there. I used meat as an example. I mentioned that there's oil is a normal part of a healthy diet and that dairy is basically a substitution and and it was a rare commodity in the past and some cultures have never even heard of dairy before. Cows were not part of their lifestyle. Maybe buffalo was part of the lifestyle and small amounts of dairy in our lifestyles. It's a modern thing now to have massive amounts of it. Something that is is important to know is doing the right thing is such a relief that you very quickly forget that you found a lot of pleasure in having things that you feel you couldn't live without once you start having the right thing. If you find love in your life, you very quickly stop looking at other people. If you find happiness and joy and comfort in your life, your mind changes very, very quickly. But while you're unhappy and uncomfortable or you're constantly searching and agitated, finding satisfaction and fulfillment in simple natural processes is deeply, deeply gratifying on all levels and solves so many problems that it's impossible to list because they're personal. So things like dairy are emotionally very comforting. They have substitute for love and they're a substitute for feeling safe and their mother's milk in many, many ways. And we need to solve all sorts of problems to give up dairy. But if you start, then it's not too hard. But the saturated fat can create all sorts of problems with the menstrual health, a whole different category to animal products. And it's a touchy subject for women because it's so attractive, things like cheese and yogurt and butter. But if you don't make that space in your life, it can create lots and lots of problems. The space to heal that is a long path sometimes. And it's not easy, but extremely rewarding. I wanted also to talk about different symptoms that emerge and and holding everything else neutral. And I know this is very simplistic, but I really wanted to talk about the reproductive system as a fundamental base that every single woman has. And I want to explore why do some women end up with different conditions, given that we have the same base. People who are suffering period problems, why don't they all have the same issues? Why do some people end up with endo? Why do some people end up with fibroids? Why do some people have bloating? Why do some people have back pain? The symptoms actually manifest differently when the organ, uh, I guess, is the same. Can you talk to us about that? We're all different, of course. And you'll find that Some people have obsessions about food. They will get really hooked up on dairy and have a massive amount of saturated fat in their diet and that leads to really big problems. Other people just have dairy products in their life and not so obsessed with massive amounts of it. So even though you're saying one person's not affected and the other one isn't, if you look at their lifestyle, you'll see that as a general thing that they might be having butter on their bread, but one person is just putting a little scrape, another person is putting a slab of butter. One person might be having a little bit of chocolate, which is, of course, just milk solids, and another person is having a whole block. One person will have an ice cream once a week and another person is having 
ice cream every single night on the way home, they'll buy ice cream. It really depends on the lifestyle. It really depends on amounts. You also have that some people are lactose intolerant. 80% of people from the Mediterranean are lactose intolerant. And surprisingly, they actually have the biggest obsession with dairy and cheese. On the other hand, in England, 80% of people are lactose tolerant. So they've had a lot more dairy products over many more generations and have developed a tolerance, which doesn't mean that they can handle massive amounts of dairy. It's just that they can handle dairy better. So some people are intolerant to dairy. They can't handle it. We're seeing a lot of Asian background people with massive problems from dairy now. They've never really had dairy in their culture, and it's making very big problems for them. They have very little tolerance for it. It really depends on them. It depends on the level of activity that they have. You can burn this stuff up. It's just a food nutrient. So if you're extremely active, very busy person, then you can burn this up. If you're working hard, walking a lot, maybe you jog every day. I don't think that it's a real answer to have inappropriate food and then exercise it out. Imagine how much better you'd feel if you're eating well and exercising. So you feel terrible if you don't exercise, and there's a lot of people like that. If they don't exercise, they feel really, really bad. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot of listeners out there whose ears just pricked up because it's not a really good thing. The effects of having a yoga class, uh, going to the gym, uh, doing regular exercise, tai chi, whatever, are profoundly good. It's great, and you feel a lot better. But you really shouldn't feel bad in the first place. Eating well is going to make that go away. So all your exercise and, and all the time you're taking to go to the gym or to yoga classes or whatever is going to be much, much more beneficial if we eat well. Yeah, so it's no real point in talking too much about how much one person has or another. It all depends on them. One person's going to exhibit massive symptoms from a very small intake and they might have a, a history of too much dairy when they were growing up and it's only a little bit of dairy they're eating now maintaining the problem. Only a little bit of meat now maintaining the problem and we need to even give up that little bit of meat once a week to allow it to heal, to let the body reverse let the body deal with the problem. I get what you're saying. I just want to tease out a little bit more because sure. there's going to be women who are listening who have got endo and others who have got fibroids and other who, sure. others who have got polycystic ovary syndrome sure. and probably a couple of other things too. So sure. if you reverse engineer it, I completely accept that everybody's different and has different yes. environmental conditions and sure. heritage and all the rest of that. However... If we've got listeners who have specific conditions and we reverse engineer it, are they all yep. kind of pointing to the same themes? It's just that yep. the illness has manifested in a different way? If we look at the general story, even though there's a lot of different symptoms that can occur, things like endometrium problems and ovary problems, and even if those don't exist, other issues where the uterus is in the wrong place, generalize about it, you can say that we need to get blood down into the lower belly and clean it. We need to flush the whole system out. It's a good way of dealing with a wide range of problems. You can do specific things for specific issues and you can treat particular problems like missing menstrual cycles, amenorrhea and, and heavy blood flow problems by doing specific things like cutting out animal products and having a, a lot more vegetables and a, a lot more salads. And you can see specific symptoms and, and deal with it in a specific ways. But the overall view would be to just clean the whole system out Try and think of it as a an area of the body that if you empty it all out and get it all shiny and clean again, that it'll all start to work properly. 
if we don't burden it with excessive nutrient. It's a good general way of looking at it. Moving on to some of the Western medical approach, I've just got some specific things that I want to ask you so that people have got some sort of read on where you th- what, what you think. The first one is painkillers, good or bad? The pain is so great a lot of the time that they're damn good. We started the whole discussion with how pain relief and taking painkillers is only going to suppress the symptom and pain is a sign that your body is under great stress and that something is causing that. Pain is an alarm signal and it's great to be able to get rid of that pain. Hopefully the painkillers are working but it's really very sensible to try to figure out why and the repercussions of painkillers everyone knows now and if everyone doesn't know now they haven't been paying attention to very simple information coming at them from the medical fraternity around them that painkillers have really quite nasty side effects if you just read the label you'll see that that and take the painkillers of course if you have to the suffering is massive we need to explore very very quickly how to find some kind of relief in a more healthy way. What about the contraceptive pill and regulating periods with the pill, good or bad? It's quite common knowledge now also that menstrual health, regulating it through the pill can lead to all sorts of hormonal problems in the, in the future. You can usually tell when someone is taking the pill to regulate their cycle, they develop discoloration in the face and their jawline swells. And these are the signs that your hormonal health is being compromised. These sorts of pills do have a lot of benefit and they, in some cases, work very, very well for people and it's their way of dealing with their life issues, whether it's contraception, etc. But if you're just taking it for menstrual health, if you're taking it to regulate your menstrual cycles only or as a way of relieving menstrual pain, then it's a really not a very good idea, especially if you're seeing discoloration in the face and swelling in the jaw. You're losing your jawline there and it's going to create back health, it's going problems, it's going to create hormonal difficulties and it's definitely affecting you emotionally. It's really important to find a much better solution to the problem. And what about a marina which is deeply implanted? Yes. What do you think of that? These modern types of treatments I've seen working quite well for people but it tends to shut down the whole system And I see this happening in many different areas in the modern medical approaches that are servicing people. It's very interesting to see how it's all evolving where antibiotics were the be-all and end-all for Western medicine. And because they use them to solve problems, as we say in natural therapies, you're going to create bigger problems. And, of course, now we have the situation where they're not working anymore and we've got all sorts of other health issues. Because we've taken so many antibiotics, it's killed our immune systems and we have people suffering on all sorts of levels from that, which is a whole new discussion, of course. And if you're solving problems for women's health with painkillers and the pill and it's not working because the problem has slowly evolved and gotten worse because the diets have slowly evolved into a more unhealthy way of eating. We need stronger therapies and the stronger therapies are things like this and it's going to create only bigger problems. So I've seen these treatments with women. It's a more modern approach and it shuts down the whole system. What that's doing to these women is, I think, shutting down their whole uterus functions and that whole part of the woman that 
makes a little bit unique to men. And that whole emotional health thing that I was talking about with women, it gets a bit damaged by these things. It's a bit esoteric what I'm talking about, but in any event, it's a very simple thing to understand that shutting down the whole lower body that way is not going to be good, especially if you're talking about sexual health, if you're talking about long-term issues. It's going to lead to, to major issues, which I haven't seen yet because these treatments are relatively new, but it's a little bit scary. And then looking at the holistic industry, which <coughs> prescribes a lot of vitamin supplements to treat different things, including period health, what do you think of taking vitamin supplements in this case and when do they become toxic in your view? Since the 90s, I think, it's so we're talking you know, 30 years ago, the Western medicine and the government have been looking at natural therapies where they're advocating pills and potions and of course the definition for medicine is a particular dosage of a particular substance for a particular amount of time and there's really very thin line between taking mega doses of vitamin C and a lot of the other remedies that Western medicine uses. So it's just pills and potions, very little difference between the two. In fact, one is derived from the other, of course. You're not dealing with the cause. If you're boosting your immune system with pills, if you're boosting your blood quality with potions, these remedies, as long as they're not causing problems, are useful but I think they should be used as a stepping stone. Now, my advice to people always is, okay, uh, maybe it's very difficult to give up sugar, and if people don't know how deadly sugar is, then they need to just open their eyes a little bit, and they should know by now that things like refined sugar should be totally eliminated from their diets just for basic sanity, and they need to know that things like natural therapies where you're using pills and potions, it's exactly the same process where we need to look at our lifestyle and not just use different kinds of medications. It ends up very expensive, even though they're very effective and they're not maybe causing the side effects that some of the stronger or different ways of approaching health where Western medicine is using very strong chemicals and natural therapies is using more natural remedies, vitamins, supplements and, and herbs and tonics, they're working a lot better in a lot of cases because they're not creating the side effects. A lot of the time they're doing very little or on the other hand doing a really good job but not dealing with the cause of the problem. We need to not just cover up our symptoms. When people come to me and I say, you've got to give up sugar, maybe they need to take herbal supplements for a while to get their body stable enough, their emotional state stable enough, and their, their mental stability helped create an ideal situation where they can eventually give up sugar. Maybe they need therapy to be able to do the real therapy, which is giving up sugar. So... People know now that sugar's not good for them, but they don't know how to stop. They try and stop, but they need therapy to do it, like giving up cigarettes. Maybe they need therapy to do it. I mean, my approach is just stop and eat good food, but I know that people find that very difficult. So where vitamins and mineral supplements are available to us and different kinds of therapies are available to us, right from Chinese herbs to crystals to massage to meditation and all, all very effective and very powerful and they're not the answer though the answer is basic lifestyle combining the two might be the right way to go especially because vitamins and minerals and supplements like this don't create a lot of side effects which is a wonderful way to go so still not an answer though Hysterectomies. So specialists often 
advocate a hysterectomy if the issue is so bad and nothing's working from, sure. a, from a Western medical perspective. What do you think about this? If one of our listeners is being told that they need to seriously think about a hysterectomy, sure. what advice would you give them in considering whether to go ahead or not? It's a common situation. I mean, a lot of the people that come to me and look at natural therapies in, in the whole, dealing with it because they've tried everything else and they're up against a brick wall. A lot of people are coming because modern Western medical processes have run out of options and they say this is all we can do. I mean, there's a million people in Australia alone, one million people that are suffering chronic pain. The painkillers don't work anymore. This is one of the situations that we're, we've got now. They are told, well, the only answer is now that we implant a a machine into you that shuts down your pain receptors. It's becoming science fiction on top of science fiction. It's really quite fascinating what's happening to us all. But, yeah, they're told, okay, let's cut out your uterus. But this is the thing where we get people in saying, they're going to cut my gallbladder out. They're going to cut half of my intestine out. This is a, a very drastic thing to do is to just cut it out where maybe they should explore other options next. And this is my dialogue that I have, I'm sure a lot of other natural therapists have also, which is to consider other options and give them a try first. That drastic approach is only there because tools that what modern Western medical science has has run out, and there are other tools. I mean, there's simple things like fasting. There's simple things like changing your diet. There's simple things like taking some kind of herbs that maybe they should try before doing that. To keep on with the painkillers, to keep on with some kind of medication, maybe swap to more natural kind of medication, which it quite often works a lot better. So if they're faced with a hysterectomy as a final option, they're told in a lot of cases, and it's not because they're bad people. I mean, the doctor's in the hospitals, uh, specialists might be the best in the world. They're good people. They're just trying to help and they're saying this is our next option. They might even say that's the only way, but there might be other ways. It's just they, they don't know. And unfortunately, ignorance is no excuse. They haven't explored those other options. They're not trained in them and will end up with the same problem, which is a hysterectomy. But if a person takes themselves out into the community of natural therapies, they might find other answers. And there's some very good people out there. Natural therapies community is not very well regulated, unfortunately. So we have a wide range of people advocating all sorts of remedies that might work and they promise everything. And I strongly recommend that if something is not working, don't do it. But if it makes sense and you're getting results, then that's the way to go. But if you're told to have a hysterectomy, what I say to people is let's try this first. And in a lot of cases, we can create relief very, very quickly. Long-term relief can take months with menstrual cycle problems because we need to get rid of physical obstructions in some cases. In other cases, we need to realign the spine. In other cases, we, we need to improve blood quality. It all depends. But some relief can be had really very quickly and hope regained. And once the pain is gone, there's, there's no need for drastic approaches anymore like a hysterectomy. And a lot of women have had great success where they're infertile. They've been told to have a hysterectomy. But in the end, they've gotten rid of their pain and gone on to have healthy, beautiful, wonderful children. And because of the difficulties they've been with, they've produced really healthy children, which is a godsend. So in fact, their problems had led them to a deep understanding of personal health and a very clear perspective on how to get a healthy pregnancy and how to deliver a healthy child and maintain their health afterwards and raise a healthy child also their difficulties were in fact a gift. If someone has had 
a hysterectomy to resolve their issues, and let's assume that fixes the symptom and not the cause, is that where it stops or is there some other part in the body that that issue could now present itself because the cause hasn't been addressed? That's a, a, a really good question. An example is removing the gallbladder as a way of dealing with severe symptoms from gallstones or something similar. And in some cases, the pain doesn't go away. It just stays there. Same with operations in the back. In some cases, it doesn't fix it. And you're given a percentage when you told to have an operation. You say, well, there's a 40% chance of this and you know, 10% chance of that because it's based on averages. And because it's based on averages, you're going to get an average response. So you're going to get an 80% success where 20% of the pain is still there. This is a problem when it comes to that kind of approach where it's not personalized and it's not very specific. So we're not going to get a 100% result. That's the problem with this sort of approach of creating a solution from having a hysterectomy. Everything is connected. Cutting the gallbladder out doesn't mean that the poor old gallbladder that was in fact the burden for a very poor diet of having lots of animal products and then cold drinks afterwards and lots of pizza and then cold beer and the bile crystallizes within the gallbladder and you've got gallstones there now and cutting that out, now the liver is burdened and the problem continues on into the stomach. Now we've got small intestine problems and large intestine problems. The same with the hysterectomy. The, in fact, the uterus was bearing the symptoms. It was flooding blood because it was discharging. The pain in the uterus was because everything was twisting in the gut and one month was painful, the next month was not so painful because one side was working, the other side wasn't. The left-right imbalance of the body now is becoming more extreme. In other words, yes, we've gotten rid of the problem in the menstrual pain by removing the uterus altogether, but now we're developing severe shoulder problems and eye problems. The One side of the head is working more than the other. We've got neck problems because there's pressure in one side of the head more than the other. Left-right imbalance is becoming more and more severe. Okay, we've removed the uterus, but now we've got severe pelvic floor problems where you lead all sorts of bladder problems, where chronic cystitis or bladder leakage all the time, and we have to wear a nappy, and that's leading to spinal degeneration because the acid levels are too high, mineral levels are too low, the bladder is not working properly, it's going to lead to all sorts of problems in the spine. In a lot of cases, I can only see more difficulties. In some cases, it solves the problem and we don't notice any other difficulties. Some people have nice, relaxed, comfortable lives and just solving the symptom it means that they don't notice other problems. You can drink alcohol and have marijuana as long as you don't have to do anything. You don't notice that you're very irritable and cranky all the time. As long as you, you just lie around and have everything done for you, it's wonderful. If you have to do anything, it's very obvious that you're, you're dysfunctional. So it really depends on your lifestyle. It really depends on who you are, whether the symptoms show up or not. But it just allows the problems to continue, but they might not be as obvious and develop a lot later. And, of course, the, the connection between the two is not obvious. Now you've got spine problems. Now you've got shoulder problems. Who would have connected that to menstrual irregularity? Only us. Moving on to something that you've mentioned in the past, which is this issue of being completely disassociated and disconnected. And you've talked about women who have disconnected from their pelvic area as a coping mechanism. Can you talk to us a little bit more about what you see in women with, uh, with issues in their menstrual cycle on this sort of level? There's three distinct parts 
And a lot of people have heard this terminology, not really understanding what it is, of course, and there's books written about it with very little understanding. There's, of course, lots of information out there, very deep understanding also. It's spirit, mind, body. We can disassociate from our body and use other parts. And it's a lovely survival mechanism that human beings have. And that's the beauty of human beings is their ability to adapt and cope. We're incredibly flexible in that way. We're very adaptable. It allowed us to you know, swarm all over the planet and live everywhere from Alaska to the Sudan. Human beings are incredibly, they're remarkable in that way. So one of those aspects is that if we have a difficulty, we can create a stress situation in our lives where we just cope. So your energy can go into your shoulders, your functionality can shut down a whole part of your body and just keep going. We can adapt, in other words. We're very flexible that way. But we need to then stop and recover and make ourselves comfortable again. If you keep going with that stress level, if you keep going with that adaptability process, you end up very, very unwell. But we're tough. We're really tough. And we can even survive on McDonald's for a long time. We're that adaptable. It creates massive problems at the same time. In our stress situation, our, our breath rate goes up. Our blood pressure goes up. We have very anxious thoughts. We become very angry or very irritable or very focused and lose our ability to be generous and cope with anything or anyone. But it's a coping mechanism. So we can shut down the pelvic floor function. We can shut ourselves away from the lower body. The hips stiffen up. Uh, the lower back stiffens. Our posture rounds. The lower back pops out the back. The neck jams, the chin lifts up. We can just assume that posture for 10, 20, 30, 40 years and cope. Everything that is not related to stress is difficult. We put ourselves into a stress situation. We look for stress around us. We create stress around us. We're not comfortable unless we are in a stressful situation. I hope that's not too difficult a concept to grasp but if you're in a very difficult position and your environment is very safe and comfortable and warm we're not comfortable something is out of balance there so we either relax which we can't do because we've created a set of circumstances in ourselves where we've shut down the whole lower body so we can't relax and enjoy. So what we do is create problems around ourselves and create difficulties around us to make ourselves feel, in a way, comfortable. I wanted to create a slightly bigger picture than the question you asked, but just so that people understand that the repercussions of living a lifestyle where you've just shut off your whole lower body and now we have you know, problems with orgasms, we have problems with reproductive cycle, we have problems with the lower body in general, which gives us a feeling of survival instinct. The lower body gives us passion and gut feeling and stability. So the end result is feeling very anxious, very worried all the time, angry and stressed and lost all our intuitive ability and then we're only very logical and very reasonable all the time rather than being passionate and unreasonable and more childish in nature. We can lose all of that if we shut down that lower body. Of course, most important is our basic health. So lower back problems, hip problems, knee and leg problems, cellulite, varicose veins, shutting down the lower body that way to cope is not really a very good solution in the long term. It's a good solution to just cope for a moment, but over the years it leads to a very big problem. Let's talk about what is normal in terms of a menstrual cycle from your point of view. What should women be thinking about in terms of normal? My understanding is that a three-day cycle is normal where there's a little bit of spotting and some flow on the second day and again a little bit of spotting. Some little bit of heaviness 
emotionally, just a little where it's sort of like tiny little bit withdrawn, but nothing that can't be overridden easily. Otherwise, no really big awareness that there is any kind of major issue happening. That's a normal process in terms of the menstrual cycle. Menopause, really non-existent in terms of any kind of symptoms. It's just that the menstrual cycle just starts to peter out a little bit and it shouldn't be as early as the 50s. I know it's happening in women's 50s now. It used to be the 60s, and even later, and it's now creeping down. I've heard of women in their 30s. It's happening too now because the whole system is breaking down and it shouldn't be accepted as normal, of course. I mean, my viewpoint is that once you reach the early 20s, you stay exactly the same until you're in your 60s. You certainly don't start aging. You certainly don't start to look any different in your 30s, 40s, or 50s. So that is not a far-fetched statement. If anyone travels a little bit and sees the rest of the world, you'll see that that's absolutely true in most cultures other than ours. It's changing quickly, so you have to look at the older women because the younger people in China and Japan and Korea now are very stupidly taken on our lifestyles. They're showing all the, the, the same problems now very quickly. But if you look at older women in other cultures, I mean, it's very hard to tell whether they're 50, 40 or 30 or sometimes in their 20s when they're in their late 50s. That's not an exaggeration. It's hard to find that now, but you can still see it. When I was traveling around the world in my 20s, it was really, really obvious. It was startling and shocking to see and exciting and wonderful at the same time. A lot of my understanding comes from practical experience. Normal health in terms of the menstrual cycle, which to me leads to no stress and uh, uh, calm, relaxed beauty that, that comes from that feminine softness and, of course, health in terms of the lack of stress. I mean, you can put up with a lot of stuff, but it doesn't mean that you have to. Normal menstrual cycle is like three days, no big drama, comes, goes, and no big difficulties. And not the massive preoccupation that people who have issues seem to have. Well, yeah. yeah. And the the joyfulness and the passionate approach to life and that's all about it, really loving every minute and being completely associated and completely in their life and participating and engaging and all that sort of stuff is part of a, a normal profile also, isn't it? It takes work. That's the thing. None of this just happens. You're born with nothing but the opportunity to be healthy and happy. We don't have the right to be happy, even though that might cause an argument in people. And it's a normal understanding within anyone who's looked at deeply how human beings are and who they are and what they are, that if you look at anyone's life, you'll see that happiness and comfort comes from working at it. You can create those wonderful circumstances that we all want, but we don't really deserve them unless we work at them. So, yeah, you work at your health, you chew your food, you brush your teeth, you get married, you find a loving partner, and you work at that relationship by every day making yourself attractive to them not expecting them to be attracted to you, not expecting your health every day, but working towards it by eating well the day before, not expecting to stay upright and attractive and beautiful in your 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, but working at it every day on a daily basis. Your house isn't clean and wonderful and exciting and attractive to be in unless you work at it, unless you go around cleaning it every day or making the bed 
every morning that you get up. You're not going to walk in at night and see a lovely, beautiful bed waiting for you unless you've made it or someone else does it for you. But the work has to be put in there for your health to be okay. It doesn't just happen. A lot of stuff just happens. The carrots just grow and the rain just falls. But we have to make use of that and accept it into our lives and work with it and allow nature to manifest. It's not going to happen without us meditating, without us trying to stay upright. My education goes way back to stand up straight. That was normal. Of course, I got into a lot of fights with my Australian school friends. I use the term loosely (laughs) because I stood up straight. And I was taught that from a very, very early age to stand up proud with my chin pulled back and my shoulders back and my tummy in. And it might have presented itself as self-interested and arrogant, but this was normal. And I'm sure a lot of Australians were, were brought up that way. But it certainly wasn't in my area where I grew up. It was a sign of thinking you're a bit too good for everyone else. And this was a normal upbringing, though, within the European community. And I'm sure in the English community it was also, but that's completely gone now. That understanding that you only get what you deserve, that happiness comes from working at it within a relationship, within your health and money and success. And anyone will tell you that in those areas, but your health isn't expected. It's something that you create. Your happiness is not expected. It's something that you create. You need to work at it. So there's a a very simple answer in those areas. And that wraps it up for today. And we hope you've enjoyed this episode just as much as we've enjoyed putting it together for you. Any listeners who would like to learn more about Andre's work or Rioho can connect and follow on Instagram and LinkedIn using the address of Rioho Wellness. We spell Rioho, R-Y-O-H-O, and then add wellness on the end, obviously. Episode notes will be loaded up and available at riohowellness.com, which is the master website. And just a few more things before you take off. Number one, do you have a health issue or question you would like explored in one of our podcasts? Please submit it to us at the website where there is a contact page, riohowellness.com website. Number two, would you enjoy being notified by very short email every time we do something on Rioja Wellness? This includes notification of our up-and-coming wellness podcasts and other things towards our tipping point. If you want to receive that, go to riojowellness.com and drop in your email address and you'll get the very next one. And we hope you really enjoy it. Thanks everyone for listening and thank you Andre for another fantastic episode. See you next time.